Hello, Ian. Today we're talking mastering, and let's hear a little about yourself. Okay, sure. Um, so I've been a professional mastering engineer for 25 years now. Hardly seems possible. I came into it in, an, I think, an unusual way. Lots of mastering engineers have already been recording engineers or producers before they get into mastering, but I had just qualified from my degree course and had been working uh, for free in a studio near where my parents lived and had written letters to, here in the UK at that time we had, uh, there was a big directory of studios and audiovisual <clears throat> facilities and I had sent letters out to, I don't know, 20 or 50 different places in, in parts of the country that I thought it might be nice to live and I got a call from uh, SRT, Sound Recording Technology, which is a leading independent mastering facility here in the UK. Um, I didn't even know what mastering was at that point, but it was a job in the music business, so I, I said yes. And it turned out that uh, I was perfectly suited to mastering. I, you know, from when I was really young, I was taking cassette tapes to pieces and rebuilding them to try and get better high frequency response and always tweaking my speaker setup and, you know, uh, worrying about end of side distortion on vinyl and all those kind of things. So, uh, yeah, they, they, you know, I was, I was trained, I was mentored, which uh, I feel really lucky about, you know, that's, that's quite rare these days. And yeah, I, I worked there for 15 years before I left to set up my own company. You do, uh, you have fought a war, um, the loudness war. Can you tell about it? Yeah, fighting, yeah, still. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the loudness war has been going on forever. Um, you know, I think we're in the second or third loudness war at this point. You know, there was a loudness war on vinyl, there was a loudness war on CD, and now there's a loudness war on streaming. And it's it's basically driven by this misconception. You know, this it's a fact that if you play somebody two pieces of audio, which are otherwise identical, and you turn one of them up ever so slightly, people will hear a difference. And most people will think that the slightly louder one sounds slightly better. It's based on something called the equal loudness curve or the Fletcher Munson curve or the smile curve, which um, basically means that the more you turn things up, the more our ears or our brains think that there is more treble and bass in the sound. So louder sounds tend to sound bigger and wider and brighter and have more space and depth and all the rest of it. So that's fine, um, but what it means is that there is a natural tendency for people to want the things that they work on to be slightly louder or a lot louder than everybody else. And again, that's fine, except that at some point you run out of headroom. So, you know, on if you're cutting vinyl, you're going to burn out the cutter head. Um, yeah. If you're uh, recording to analog cassette, you're going to saturate the cassette and with CDs and other digital formats, um, you know, file formats that we use these days, you have zero dB FS, this maximum limit that uh, the signal can't go beyond without clipping. Now you can keep pushing the loudness up closer and closer to that point, but in order to do that, you have to use, you have to control the dynamics somehow. So to stop the music kind of jumping up over the top and dis distorting, you have to use compression and limiting. And so the loudness war is this kind of race of people trying to get louder than everybody else. And the, the problem with it is that it can actually harm the music, in my opinion. The, you know, there's, you definitely need to be loud enough. Uh, if, if something is too dynamic, it can be almost as much of a bigger of a problem. You, it can, uh, the verses and choruses can, it can be too much difference. Um, it may not sound full or dense or um, thick enough or aggressive enough or intense enough if that's what you're going for in terms of the sound um, but once you get past a certain point it stops sounding better and it just starts sounding worse it can feel held in and kind of claustrophobic and um, dull and lifeless and, and if you go too far it can actually end up being distorted so there, there's, there's a sweet spot that, that is the ideal place to be yeah, I, I I guess that's why people are liking vinyl more today, because it's it's not over compressed as it was on on CDs. Well, it's vinyl is complicated because lots of vinyl is still over compressed, um, 
because the something that lots of people don't realize is that lots of vinyl is actually cut from the same digital file that was used for all the other masters. Um, the difference is that, as I say, you can, simply can't cut vinyl super hot because you'll burn out the, the cutting head on the lathe um, and they cost a fortune, so no vinyl cutting engineer is going to want to do that. Um, so there's not really any point in making it super loud beforehand because it's going to get turned down. So what you sometimes find is that people decide to take advantage of that and kind of say, OK, well, because it's going to be for vinyl, I'm going to actually ease back a bit and make use of the, the available headroom. And so in those cases, you can end up with vinyl releases that are more dynamic and sound better than the digital versions. But that's it's not all of them by any means. It's, it's a certain proportion. And I mean, there are other things that people like about the vinyl sound as well, you know, that all contribute and you get those things as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, I mean, my advice in general to people is to always master as though it was going to vinyl. In my opinion, you know, I mentioned that the sweet spot, if you imagine it's going to vinyl and optimize it in that way, it will sound fantastic on all of it, sound fantastic on vinyl and on digital and on streaming and on cassette and anywhere else you want to, to put it. So, and it's interesting that, that you know, that the technical limitations of the vinyl format actually correlate really closely with so many of our favorite albums, you know, from back in the, in the day when things were cut from uh, to vinyl. You listen to those and think, well, they sound fantastic. And it, it just fits perfectly into that sweet spot. And it, it's still true, but the majority of releases these days are pushed much harder than that. And today, and for some years, you have been doing a show on on podcast uh, streaming services and on YouTube, um, still only the mostly only the audio. Um, tell a little about about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's called the Mastering Show, and it's it's a show where we talk about anything and everything related to mastering and some other stuff that I think is interesting as well. So. Um, we've been going three or four years now, uh, almost up to our 80th episode, and people really seem to like it. Um, my co-host is John Tidy, uh, who runs reaperblog.net, and also used to be co-host of the Home Recording Show. So he has uh, you know, great experience in, in podcasts. And every week we try and pick a topic or have a guest and you know, really dive into the kind of topics that we're talking about here, you know, about loudness and, you know, how to, what to do in mastering, what not to do in mastering, you know, what is mastering, um, you know, uh, anything that we think people would be interested in, basically. And yeah, it's it's been really successful. I've actually, I've had some people write to me saying that they love the show and they're, they've kind of listened all the way through to it two or three times, which... <laughs> <laughs> I find hard to believe. I, I get tired of listening to my own voice, let alone somebody else having to listen to it all the time. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's great that people have, have responded so well to it. I've, I've only heard them once. Um, and I must say that there are many episodes. Um, uh, what are you on? Uh, above 100? No, or? I think I think uh, this is, I think the last one we recorded, the one we just released is number 79. So we're coming oh. up for the 80th episode. So <laughs> yeah. it'll be on 100 soon. Yeah. I must say, I I, I, I learned a lot uh, in, in, in that show. I also got a, got a bit confused. Um, <laughs> but but, but I, in the end, I, I really learned a lot also about the confusion and, and why I shouldn't be confused. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting because one of my favorite sayings is that mastering is simple, but that that doesn't mean that it's easy. Right. Um, so, you know, we can talk a bit about what mastering actually is, but, you know, at its essence, it's it's very straightforward. It's just about balancing the EQ and the dynamics of all the pieces of music um, to fit together into a pleasing, you know, uh, collection, whether that be a single or a playlist or an album. But when you, you know, it's music, right? So 
there are technical issues and there are but a lot of it is is it's art it's taste it's subjective so there's a, there's some really interesting gray areas in the middle of it and a lot of mastering in particular a lot of it is quite technical you know in in recording and mixing up to a point if it sounds good it is good regardless of what it was, it was that you did to you know i think sylvia massey you know runs audio signals through potatoes and other pieces of fruit or you know records things in a an abandoned aircraft hangar just because it sounds interesting or records the sound of a guitar being towed along a road behind a truck you know all of those are things that you might say are wrong but they're not wrong because they end up getting a creative result that she likes that also applies in mastering but to a much lesser extent my goal when i'm mastering is to be invisible you know that my simple definition of mastering is to make it the music sound the best that it can be but that involves having empathy for what the artist and the engineers were trying to achieve and not i'm not trying to stamp my own sound on something i don't want to listen somebody to listen to it and go oh wow listen to the the mastering compression that ian used on that you know i just want them to listen to it and say oh, i love this piece of music it, you know it makes me want to dance or cry or laugh or sing and, and not be thinking about the technical aspects at all so i want my part to be invisible and that means you have to have a pretty deep understanding of the music you know that what they were trying to achieve and how to get there but also all of the technical stuff that enables you to do that so keeping invisible is that why you made the dynamic range day no dynamic range day is very much about being visible <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so dynamic range day is is it's a, an online event designed to make a noise about the loudness war you know, I wanted to help raise awareness of the issue. So it started off, the original idea was just that everybody would type in capital letters all day, which, you know, is, is known as shouting on the internet. Um, and that was meant to be, uh, you know, it's kind of a joke about, because the, the, the whole thing about loudness is that you can't have something, something can't sound loud unless it's got something quiet to contrast with. Um, so when you type in capital letters all the time, you know it reads in a very shouty kind of way and the same is true of music if you just slam the loudness the whole time th there's no light and shade there's no variety anyway so that was a fun idea for the first dynamic range day um, and people enjoyed it but the people doing it enjoyed it much more pe than the people watching it um who just found it annoying so we changed it from from then on uh and it's you know it's kind of evolved over the years but every year we i give away an award to an album from the previous 12 months um, that has had great dynamics and ideally is kind of popular, accessible, mainstream, because I have no problem with people making music super loud if that's what they want to do. My concern is that so many people feel that they have to make their music loud in order to sell records or to compete or, um, you know, to, to, to sound right. Um, and that's the bit that, that concerns me is when people make you know the the last miley cyrus album was a kind of pop folk thing and was a minus four lufs we could talk about lufs um that's 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 as loud as a metallica album right and it's miley cyrus singing pop folk um it makes no sense to me that artistically and i mean m maybe that was her artistic vision but I, I i bet that wasn't the case so dynamic range day is about saying look here are all these albums that have been super successful sound fantastic um and weren't ridiculously loud um and just m making people aware of the the issues and and having a bit of fun at the same time when i was at college um i did physics and music mm -hmm. um and it was literally a physics degree and a music degree running side by side so i so part of the time would be quantum mechanics and part of the time would be bach chorales and schenkerian analysis and stuff but there was a crossover in the middle which was the acoustics course um and the thing that i thought you might be interested to know is that um our uh the lecturer the guy who ran the course um had been teaching since i guess maybe not the 60s but maybe the 70s um and uh, in the studio um they had a synthy 1000 mm. um which is 
you know, like a VCS three the size of a wall. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, part of our we were set exercises where it was kind of you know simple synthesis of you know creating these kind of things and create you know certain envelope shapes and all the rest of it. Um, I have to say it was incredibly labor intensive for some sounds that really weren't worth it at the end of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was an amazing machine. Um, it had candlesticks on it. That's how big it was. <laughs> <laughs> Our viewers uh, are mostly synth geeks, and many of them do their mastering themselves or want to do it. So let's go into that subject. Can you go through the steps of mastering? Master, as I say, mastering for me is about making the music sound the best that it can be. And I think maybe the first thing to say is that I think there's real value in it being a separate process to mixing. Lots of people ask me whether you can use mastering process on the mix bus. Um, and of course, in a practical sense, that's that's perfectly possible. There's nothing to stop you bringing mastering plugins in on the stereo output of a mix and running them at the same time as you do the mix. But personally, I think that's a mistake. The way that I prefer to work is to mix as a, as a process and, and get the, the, the sounding the best that I possibly can and export that as a stereo file. And when it comes time for mastering, ideally, especially if it's something that I've been working on, I would leave some time, um, you know, a week or two maybe between the two um, to, to kind of get some distance and get some perspective. And then I like to bring all of the songs into, I use WaveLab, but you can use any DAW for, for mastering processing at any rate. Um, and I line all of the songs up in a timeline. WaveLab lets you put them out all on the same track, and then you can put individual processing on each clip. But even if you have a, a DAW that doesn't allow, I think most lots of them do these days, but um, even if that's not possible with the DAW you're using, you can put each one on its own channel in the mixer. Um, and that allows you to have separate processing on each song. And that's really important. Um, there's, you know, lots of people kind of think that mastering is a, Oh, you just put a limiter and a, and a level boost over all of the songs and, and you're done. And that misses out on the, the real benefit, which is to look at each song individually and say, OK, I'm going to I'm going to set the level and the EQ and the dynamics processing separately for each song. Um, so that's a really important part of the equation for me. The actual process is is very simple for me. First thing I do is lift the level up um, because I mentioned about the way that loudness affects the way that we hear things. If you if you start EQing and compressing something at a lower level and then decide to turn it up, you're probably going to have to change all of those settings that you just made because it's going to sound different to you because you've turned it up. Um, so first thing I do is bring the level up. I think, did you have a question? Yeah, about the level, um, I've always wondered why you have to deliver for mastering um, a mix which is... Uh, a certain amount of uh, dBs low, when when the mastering engineer can just lower it when he receives it. Why? Why? Uh, you you don't have to. Uh, no. is, is the simple answer. But I often suggest it, and lots of mastering engineers request it. I mean, I think historically, when I started out mastering, most of the masters came in on on digital audio tape, the uh, kind of small, kind of sort of. Um, they're almost like the video Dad. cartridges used to put in camcorders. Yeah. Um, and those would typically have, they'd have meters on them, but those meters were often analog meters rather than actually reflecting the digital signal. And so they weren't necessarily perfectly calibrated. So people were coming from this tradition of analog tape where you would allow the meters to push up into the red. And that's when you knew you were about right. And if you let the digital meters hit the red, then you're actually clipping. Yeah. So we would always encourage people to leave a few dBs of space back then. And I still encourage it these days because you're absolutely right. We, the mastering engineer can turn it down if they need to. But the, I mean, another thing to say is that a modern DAW can handle peak levels that go above zero because most all modern DAWs are use floating point processing. And the big advantage of floating point is that the levels can go above zero and they don't get clipped internally. So the, the only time you have to worry about the absolute peak level is at the output stage when you actually export it to a file. 
but there are also lots of plugins out there these days that emulate analog gear you know um channels ssl channel strips and tape emulations and emulations of valve or tube gear and one of the things that they emulate often is the fact that if you push analog gear hard it will distort um, and often it distorts in a pleasing way so that's not necessarily a problem but that gear was probably designed to be operated with the a kind of nominal level of about minus 18 rms peaks can go higher um, but the rms level or the vu level actually back then which is the original way that they used to measure rms level um, would, would be around zero vu which was about minus 18 on a digital meter now if you push your signal up super high and then run it out to one of those plugins you're actually operating it at a much higher level than the original analog gear was designed to be used at now again that's not necessarily a problem if you like the way that it sounds but the risk is that all of these things get run flat out and nobody ever bothers to listen to them at a, a more realistic real world level um, so my suggestion to people is to always leave a few dbs of peak headroom because it just reduces the risk of doing that you know everything can then be lower um, there's no risk of any clipping uh, and you know it's, it's fine 24 bit audio there's no need to get anywhere near zero at the mix stage i mean there's no need. you don't have to at the mastering stage either except that that's the way that everybody does it um, but yeah that that's so it's not really a requirement but i think it is a good rule of thumb is the, yeah. the kind of answer to the question so while while we are at, at at that subject um also compression and should a mix be compressed or should you leave that for the mastering engineer um i don't know whether there's a should but a mix certainly can be compressed um i mean when i was taught mastering the it's interesting because these days everybody's excited about analog gear and analog emulation um, but when i got into the mastering profession the, the coolest thing was to have ddd on your cd meaning it was digitally recorded digitally mixed and digitally mastered so so everything that i was using was digital and that was thought to be a good thing so even though i was using hardware it was effectively in the box because it never went back into the analog domain so that was the that was the way that I was trained and that's still my kind of mindset really is that analog is a flavor that might be used in some cases rather than the standard way of doing it whereas there are lots and lots of other engineers who only use analog and all the time and it's very much part of their way of working so neither of those is right or wrong in the same way I wasn't taught to have a compressor on the mix bus but many many people are so if you like mixing into a compressor then that's what you should do and that's how you should send it to the mastering engineer because if you are using heavy mix bus compression and you take it off the mix will change dramatically so the mastering engineer will be hearing something different than you've been working on um, occasionally you will i will get sent something where i feel that the that compression has been overdone so I might ask the client, oh, are you interested in trying a version that's been pushed a little less hard to see whether I can get even more out of it? But I would always like to hear both so that I can hear what they've been working on and make sure that I'm kind of sticking with their vision for it. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely fine to use compression when you're mixing if, if you like it and it gets you good results. Okay, good. And then let's, back to, let's get back to the mastering steps. Uh, mm -hmm um so uh leveling that was where we were yeah so the first stage is to get all of the levels consistent so i will literally just work through the project and fairly quickly bring them up so that they are where i consider the the sweet spot is the right kind of level i have a limiter a very clean digital limiter at the end of the chain just to prevent clipping um Quite often that means that the limiter is working too hard at that stage. Um, and that's just a clue to me that I'm probably going to need to use some other kind of dynamic control. But if I bring the level up and the song sounds fantastic, at that point I'm done. You know, at that point I wouldn't do any more. And that's another thing I like about doing the level first is that it encourages 
a minimalist approach. The best way to be invisible is to not do anything. Of course, you've done something because you've changed the level and that affects the way that we hear things. Yeah, that's that's stage one. Once the level is in the right place, and I take a quick tangent to say that obviously monitoring in a mastering studio is very, very important. So the acoustics and the monitoring need to be as accurate as possible. And one of the things that I do is I always have my monitoring at the same gain level, at the amp, basically. So that means that as soon as I hear something, I can tell how loud or quietly it's been mastered because I've been listening to things at the same monitoring level since forever. I actually have two levels. I also have a dimmed level, which is 12 dB down, um, and I work with that as well quite a lot, but they're, they're very, very consistent. So I don't need to look at the meters too much. I just bring the song up till it sounds right to me at my mastering monitoring level. Um, and then I'm also going to hear it, and that, then I also can very quickly get an idea of whether the EQ is right or not. Um, I mean, when people are mastering things themselves, and on, I do a, a course called the Home Mastering Masterclass, where I, I teach people how to do this kind of stuff, um, and I do suggest that on that that people use reference tracks. So bringing in something that sounds fantastic to you everywhere else in the world, putting it in your DAW, I would recommend adjusting the loudness first. I mean, if you want to match the loudness, then that's fine. But there's a good chance it's been mastered super loud, and I don't really think that's necessary um, because of streaming, normalization, and all the rest of it. So probably bring the level down, and then you can use that as your reference track and compare it with the stuff that you're working on to see whether you're in the right ballpark. But for me, I don't often use reference tracks because I know in my head how things are meant to sound on my system. So then it's a question of balancing the EQ. The EQ changes the way that it sounds, so you might need to tweak the level again. Um, and then by the time you get to that stage, you've probably got a good idea of whether or not it needs extra dynamics processing. So whether it needs some gentle compression, whether it's hitting the limiter too hard, that kind of thing. So then I move on to the stage of optimizing the dynamics. Um, but before you do that, um do you think of of imaging um i mean the stereo image um uh, bass and such well it's um sometimes <laughs> um <laughs> i tend to approach it for me it's like layers of an onion you know you have an onion and it's got a kind of really gnarly kind of outside so you peel that off and it looks smoother and nicer but might still have some imperfections so maybe you cut another couple of layers off and then it looks really good in comparison to what it did originally but there's still a few little blemishes for me it's the same with audio so stage one is bring the level up and then it's whatever hits me next and usually that's eq um because usually something will benefit you know it once you get it to the right level and start listening to it in comparison to the other songs, because I'm constantly flicking the nice, I've got all the songs laid out in the DAW so I can quickly skip from one song to another. So I'll listen to say lots of loud sections or lots of quiet sections and just see how they fit together and get an idea of the overall shape of the, the album or the EP or whatever it is as well. Um, and then, yeah, so usually the first thing I think is, Oh, actually that one is a bit bass heavy in comparison to that one. And this one, it's not quite bright enough or it it's too bright whatever that might be so usually the eq is the next thing that i do then i think there are kind of two degrees of of thinking about the stereo image i mean one thing i should say is that for me 90 percent of mastering is eq compression and limiting so i do fairly often adjust the stereo image but it's a much smaller factor usually than uh, the EQ and the dynamics. And so sometimes I'll just hear something and it's like, oh, okay, that's maybe the, the image is super wide. And I just think, okay, that I need to bring that in a little bit. Or it's really, really mono. And I think, oh, I'd really like some more space. So if that's the next thing that jumps out to me, I might do that and then do the dynamics processing. Or I think maybe more often than not, I would probably do the dynamics processing first. And then I'm listening to it and thinking, Oh, okay, now actually maybe it leads a little bit of gentle tweaking to the stereo image, or maybe it'll be work better if I adjust that. So it's, I wouldn't say there's a hard and fast rule about what I do next. I, I tend to do the stereo processing prior to the compression, 
Um, I like the EQ and the stereo image to be right hitting the compressor because I think that's how you get to sound most invisible. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily always actually make the changes straight away depending on, on what I hear. So your chain is not static. Uh, you can sometimes do something before something else. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it's the I mean, the other thing to say is so at this point, we've got the whole process, right, which is level, EQ, and dynamics. Um, but at each stage, so listen to the level, how does that affect the EQ? Tweak the EQ. Does that mean I have to retweak the level a bit? Okay, now maybe I'm going to try some dynamics processing. Well, that might change Maybe it holds back the loudest sections, or maybe it brings up the quieter sections. If it brings up the quieter sections, maybe the overall song now feels a little bit louder than it did. So I'll bring the loudness back again. And I make those adjustments prior to the compression, because for me, it's again, it's all about minimalism. So if I can get the level down going into the compressor, that will result in less compression. So And usually that's what I want. And so then I've affected the amount of compression by adjusting the level. So maybe that means I have to tweak the EQ. Um, so I tend to think of it it's the ideal is that every time the changes are smaller so you make big changes to start with and that at each stage you hone in on the final perfect result um it doesn't always work that way when you're starting out it takes some practice but you basically just go round and round in circles so level eq compression level eq compression level eq comp actually that's about right um and at any point in there i might say oh how about a bit of stereo image work or maybe uh oh it needs a little bit of gentle saturation or um maybe the, the contrast between the verse and the chorus now that i've got the compression in place needs a little bit more emphasis so i might lose a little bit of subtle automation to just ease a section of the song back and then bring it back up for another end perhaps um so it's it's very much an in and the other thing is that you know you do all of that for the first song and then you move on to the second song and when you're doing it with the second song, you're doing it comparing back to the first song. So you might actually decide, oh, now I've heard the second song, I'm not quite happy with what I did with the first song. So I might go back to that and tweak that. And then you're onto the third song and it just, you know, and it gradually evolves. Um, so it's very much an interactive process and the, the order is never the same. It's never set in stone. It's, you know, the, the whole idea is to find the perfect settings for each piece of music and it's always different. When when doing mastering, there are a lot of words like RMS and and uh, loves. Can you explain that? I can try. <laughs> um, so I think I mentioned before that. So when I was trained, um, I we measured loudness or we judged loudness using a VU meter, which is an old fashioned needle meter. Um, so you know it was all about. A current running through a coil made the needle move and it that reading roughly corresponds to the rms level rms is re, root mean squared so the output meters in a daw show peak level and they respond basically you can imagine those those meters are sort of tracing up and down with the actual waveform you know they're very fast very detailed um, they are unfortunately almost useless for assessing loudness um, you know, you can measure a change in loudness if you have one thing that peaks at minus three and another thing that peaks at minus nine, then you know that if nothing else has changed, there's a six dB difference. Um, but actually, almost always there is something else that's different. It's probably hit a limiter or a compressor or whatever. So, um, peak, yeah, it's if you imagine uh, a snare hit versus a sustained pad sound. The snare hit has a massive transient at the beginning and then very quickly decays down to a tiny little thing, whereas the pad sound is going along like this all the time. If you turned the peaks of the, the pad sound up to match the, the peak level of the snare, that sound would be the same less level as the beginning of the snare the whole way through. So it would sound much, much louder than the snare would. And anybody who's ever tried to record an actual snare or a, a gunshot, for example, will know that. They, they often sound really lame. Um, until you start processing them and compressing them and limiting them. So root mean squared RMS is basically an average of that peak level. It's, it's averaged over a 300 millisecond time window um, and it gives you something that corresponds more closely 
to what we hear as loudness. Um, so if you match the RMS level of two things, they're much more likely to sound of a similar loudness. Um, LUFS, which is the modern method of, of the internationally agreed standard method of measuring loudness. Um, so LU stands for loudness unit, full scale FS. Um, it's basically a, a variation of RMS, actually. Um, you basically add some filtering in to recognize the fact that our ears are much more sensitive in the, the broadly speaking, in the two kilohertz kind of region. So the upper mids, um, if you start turning up the upper mids on a signal, it will sound louder quicker than if you start boosting the bass or the very high treble. Um, so LUFS, try and take that into consideration. So it's a more useful version of RMS than RMS, basically. Uh, does that help? The, the other thing that is a bit more complicated about LUFS is that you will often hear that there are three different types talked about. So there's what is known as the momentary LUFS, which, like peak levels, measures very fast, very rapid changes in loudness. There is the short-term LUFS, which is actually averaged over two or three seconds, uh, or in fact three seconds, um, and varies more slowly, but I find more helpful for assessing the loudness of music. Um, and then there's the integrated loudness, integrated LUFS, which is an average over an entire piece of audio. So it could be over an entire song or over an entire album or an entire movie, whatever that is. <clears throat> and they're all useful for different things. Um, the integrated loudness is a helpful kind of summary of the loudness of a piece of music. So if something is at minus nine LUFS as opposed to minus 16 LUFS, you know the one at minus nine is probably louder. But it's, it's a very crude measure. It's only a single number for an entire song or an entire album. So there could be a lot of variety in there. Um, if there is a lot of variety, then only certain moments of it will sound really loud and the rest of it will sound a bit quieter. Whereas if there's very little variety and it's very loud all the way through, that's going to give you a different impression. So I think something that people find confusing, I often get, people often say to me, well, I made all my songs minus 14 LUFS or whatever the, the number is, but they still sound a different loudness. Um, and my answer to that is, well, that's because we don't expect everything to be equal loudness. Um, if you have, if, if it's an indie rock album and you have an acoustic ballad and a, an aggressive guitar song, you expect the acoustic ballad to be quieter than the aggressive guitar song. So if you master both of those to minus 14, the acoustic ballad is going to sound too loud or in comparison that the aggressive guitar song is going to sound too quiet in comparison to the acoustic ballad. So it's not that there's a problem with LUFS. I mean, LUFS is not perfect. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I have to say works for 80 to 90% of material really well. Um, but you need to understand how to use it. And one of the first things to understand is it's not intended as a goal or a target, not the integrated LUFS because of this variety and the differences in genres um, and uh, arrangements and, and all the rest of it. What I find more valuable in mastering is to use the short term LUFS. And the approach that I recommend people use is to balance or match the balance, not match the loudest sections of a song. Um, so if you have <clears throat> a song that is loud all the way through, and a song that's basically quiet and has a loud ending. If you match the loud ending with the song that's loud all the way through and then balance the quieter sections of the song that starts off quiet musically with that, then it's going to work. They will have completely different integrated values. The one that's mostly quiet will have a much lower value because most of the song is quiet, but they will yeah. feel well. musically correct next to each other. Um, and that is a very effective strategy for so when people come to me and you know I, I, people keep asking how loud should i master for cd or for streaming or whatever and i say you, that's the wrong question you know if i gave you an integrated val loudness value it will be wrong but yeah. if you take the loudest sections and make them consistent and you can make those loudest se sections as loud as you like depending on what your opinion of the loudness war is 
um, and then balance everything else musically, everything will fall into place. Yeah, that that, that will work uh, with the raising levels on the on the quiet sections. Um, but if it's classical, where where what do you do then? Um, I usually um, use the integrated loudness, but I measure it on on a short um, period of the loud material. Um, well, I mean, um, if you have if you have um, if you measure the short term loudness of something and it's fairly consistent. So I mentioned that when I'm mastering, I like to skip between the loud sections of various songs. If you do that, you'll find that the short term loudness and the integrated loudness are very similar, right? Because if you only measure a, sh a short section of music, the short term loudness and the integrated, the average loudness of that section will be very similar. Um, so you're effectively doing the same thing there. Um, I mean, I have to say mastering classical is harder. It's, it's much more challenging um, in terms of, of getting the loudness right. Um, yeah, because but you don't use compression there either. Not much, at least. I, no, it's very rare. that I might use some very gentle limiting, um, depending on what the material is. But no, I tend to just use automation. But I mean, if, if I can if I can just let it run <clears throat> without any dynamic processing at all, then that's probably the best. But there are, there's a lot of classical music where actually the natural dynamic range is too much for a domestic listening situation. So I remember when I was <clears throat> uh, young, um, I was a big fan of Simon Rattle, who is now the uh, conductor of the uh, Berlin Phil, I think, as well as many other um, orchestras. Uh, but at the time he was conducting the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra here in the UK. And I had two recordings by him. One was of Mahler's second symphony and one was of The Dream of Gerontius by Elgar. The Mahler recording had been mastered impeccably. So the quiet sections sounded beautifully quiet and the fortissimo sections were absolutely earth shattering. Um, but even so, the dynamic range had been reduced tastefully from the natural sound of it. It's not like they just put the mics up and let it go. There was still recording and mixing technique being used in that to achieve that result. The Elgar recording was also very good um, and, and also had you know technique being used. But for me, it wasn't as successful because what I found was if you turned up the quiet section so that you could hear the singers clearly, and they sounded full and, oh, excuse me. And they sounded uh, full and um, natural. When you got to the loud sections, it was too loud. It was uncomfortable. You were worried that the speakers weren't going to be able to handle it. And if you turned that down so that the loud section sounded big and impressive and full, when it got back to the really quiet sections again, suddenly everything sounded too small and too distant. So if I had been mastering that, then I would have used automation effective like riding the fader back in the days of analog to bring up the quieter sections and get that balance right and the great thing about automation is you can do it with great precision so you can choose where the changes are going to happen and make sure that they are invisible um, as i said but it's a different strategy than you know using a multi-band compressor on a, a rock or an edm track true peak um what is that? <laughs> it's, so, well, it's another. So, so the the loudness units, the LUFS is defined by um, a standard called R one two eight, and un, and that includes the description of short term um, integrated and momentary loudness, and it also defines true peak level. So there's a kind of a complete package of measuring loudness. In audio, so true peak is like the true the peak signal that we talked about, the one that I said that's not really useful for measuring loudness. Um, the one thing that it is useful for is to tell you whether or not you're clipping. And again, I mentioned before, you know, clipping. And sometimes people use clipping distortion as a as a creative effect, um, but that for me, that's not something you should be doing at the mastering stage. Um, if it happens, it should be inaudible. And the problem with it is that it very quickly becomes quite audible and it inflicts a lot of damage on the audio signal and it's not very 
mu musical damage. You know, if you slam an analog tape, there's some distortion there, but it's it's kind of quite nice, quite musical sounding distortion. It can be, and um, the same in my experience is not true of digital clipping. So the true peak level is just a refinement again like as lufs is an improvement on our rms true peak is a an improvement on the digital peak or the, the sample peak meters that we used to have um it's basically oversampled so it's basically um running at a higher sample rate so that it can spot cases where the the reconstructed waveform so when it's converted from digital back to analog for playback the peak levels might actually go above zero and that can happen when the musical signal has been quite heavily limited and the loudness is high if you're pushing up against zero sample peak um, zero dbfs all the time it's hard to describe without a picture but if you imagine that the, the, if, the, if the waveform is doing this when it gets reconstructed it actually does this and it actually overshoots that zero point um, and that can be an issue for a lot of, especially consumer gear, especially, you know, the um, converters that you get in mobile phones and uh, portable devices, especially, or, or consumer electronics, where they don't have enough analog headroom to accommodate that overshoot. So the true peak level predicts when you might have um, peak levels that go above zero and cause extra distortion further down the processing chain. So that could be at a digital to analog converter. More likely these days, it's probably when a an MP3 file or another lossy data compressed format gets decoded. So when something is uh, converted for playback on YouTube or Spotify or wherever, you know, I'm sure everybody knows that they're using data compressed codecs, which throw away 90% of the data. Um, still sounds remarkably like the original audio signal but the that process is is actually pretty brutal in terms of what it does you know it slices the audio up into very narrow bands and it assesses the audibility of each band it throws away the ones that you thinks you can't hear keeps the others then rebuilds it and it, i mean if anybody who's done any kind of complex filtering on audio knows that it will change the peak level it messes with the phase all the rest of it um so the chances of that reconstructed waveform being the same as the one that went in are very low. They can sound very similar, but there are often peaks that go up beyond the original maximum peak, which if it's zero dBFS means that they could go above that level. So again, if you have a file that you're measuring and the loudness meter tells you that the true peak level is plus two, that means when you play it back, on a digital to audio to analog converter the peak levels might go above zero but more likely if you encode it to mp3 the mp3 can encode the peaks that go above zero but when you decode it those peaks are likely to get clipped off um, and cause extra distortion so mm, that's a really complicated answer but luckily the advice that i can give you is fairly simple if you're not mastering at extreme loudness my suggestion is to keep the peaks at minus one true peak some people say you shouldn't master or shouldn't mix on on headphones and others says you should um some says both what do you say i say whatever works for you um you know there are there are pros and cons for each for me personally i prefer to work on speakers um, you get that physical interaction with the sound. Um, you get to hear how it interacts with the room. Um, and I've put a lot of time and effort into getting the monitoring in my studio, you know, as, as accurate as possible. So I know that I can rely on it. Um, but that did take a lot of time and experimentation and it requires some acoustic treatment. And I'm lucky that my um, little room here is not near anybody um, who is going to be upset by the sound that comes out because the, the room is not soundproofed. It's it's acoustically treated, so it sounds good, but it, it, quite a lot of that sound goes out into the outside world. Um, so that's a challenge. That can be difficult to do, and there is no such thing as a perfect room. 
even an acoustically designed, the best studios in the world have uh, peaks and nulls in the frequency response. They have a sweet spot where everything sounds great and they have other areas where things don't sound as good. Um, you know, it varies from room to room, but the advantage of headphones is that you have no room. The speakers are right on your ears, so you only have to rely on the accuracy of the headphones in terms of the, the sound that you get. So, uh, I mean, for example, I have a pair of Sennheiser HD 650s. They're expensive, but they're not ridiculously expensive. And they're very, very good. They have a reasonably flat frequency response. I think the most important thing about them is that they are very, very low distortion in comparison to most headphones. Lots of headphones are, have a ton of distortion in there. And if the if the headphones are distorting, then you it's difficult to know what's the headphones and what's the music. So it's possible to miss details in what you're working on. And that's very important at the mastering stage. Um, you can use something like Sonarworks to, if you have a custom profile for the, so it's actually measured for the, the actual pair of headphones that you're using. Um, if you buy a pair or send them off to Sonarworks to get them measured, that can be really helpful. They have a, a generic setting, sort of an average setting, and I've found that's less successful. Um, but with those, the frequency response gets to be very, very accurate. So, and I mean, for example, I interviewed Glenn Schick on the podcast, on the mastering show. Um, he is a, a pro mastering studio. I mean, he, a pro mastering engineer. He used to own a multi-room facility and he now masters on headphones from a laptop. Uh, very often, or sometimes, next to a beach, uh, he told me, which sounds pretty appealing to me. Um, I think, you know, I, I mentioned I spent 10, 15 years being trained and, and learning my craft at a professional mastering studio and I was working on speakers all that time. That's still my preference. Maybe if I had been trained working on headphones, I would prefer working on headphones. I mean, he moved from headphone uh, speakers to headphones, so it's, it's certainly possible. Um, I think it wants to be a really expensive pair of headphones. Uh, you know, I think, I'm not sure which models Glenn is using now, but he at one point he was using Audacy, where you're talking thousands of dollars for a pair of headphones, which is a lot of money. Um, and I think the other thing you need to be careful of with, with headphones, for me, when I, well, when I did the, the videos for the Home Mastering Masterclass course, I was using that the HD 650s and I noticed I had a tendency to turn them up very loud because I wasn't getting that feedback in the room. I was almost looking for it on my head um, and I would take them off and, and realize that I had been monitoring much louder on headphones than I would on speakers. I think there's a genuine risk there that you might end up damaging your hearing um, working on headphones. So it would require a great deal of restraint. Um, and I think also you have to kind of have an intuition in that case for how it's going to sound in the room. If you've got it pumping out of speakers, you know that the bass is hitting you in the chest. You can, to a certain extent, you can feel the sound. You don't get that in the same way with headphones. So you have to kind of, it's a different mindset. You have to tune into it differently. Um, but, you know, you do have the advantage that your studio is in your in your hand, basically, or in a, in a case that you carry around with you. So, you know, I, I mean, that's what I do. If I if I go to a, an unfamiliar studio, I take the Sennheisers because then I can put them on and I know exactly that's a kind of a benchmark for me. Oh, OK, that's how they sound. How does it sound on the speakers? It's an extra data point, which is very useful. Yeah, so so it's actually important to to work with the same phones for for years um, to learn them. Um, I think that's an important part of, yeah. of mastering in general is yeah. you, you know you need to know the mastering it's not necessary to have the perfect room or perfect monitoring i mean the better the room and the better monitoring or the better the headphones the easier it gets you know the reason that professional mastering engineers have spent tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds on their equipment and their room is because it makes their life easier you know they can work faster and more reliably but the most important thing is a lot of time i mean one suggestion that i give to people is to just make sure you listen to lots and lots of music in your mix or mastering room. You know, lots of us will put a load of time and effort into a special place that we can make and work on our music. Uh, 
and then you so you go there and you listen to your your own music and then you go somewhere else to listen to everybody else's music um you need to take everybody else's music into your mixing or mastering room and have it playing there so that you can learn how it sounds on your system because if you that way your ears will tune in and you're going to go oh that's what that should sound like and then your instincts will make you move your own music in the right direction and you don't have to it's not like you have to sit there kind of going listening really intently um i you know put it on when you're serving the internet or writing a letter or soldering cables or you know um fixing patch cables whatever it is just have that music playing all the time and subconsciously you'll pick up the way that it's meant to sound when mixing and mastering People tend to use their eyes a lot. Is that really the smartest? <laughs> it's, I think it's very useful when you're learning. So, I mean, I, when I was trained, I was, I had, there was a VU meter in my studio and I was told that that was going to be a useful indication for me of loudness. And uh, I also had a very simple um, spectrum meter that showed me, I think it was only eight bands Eight, eight frequency bands, but it showed me roughly how much bass, middle, and top there were in the signal. And those are really useful ear training tools, um, especially when you're, you're, you're learning. You know, at this point, I could identify most frequencies by ear, but back then that wasn't the case. That's a skill that I le had to learn. Um, so in that sense, I think meters are very valuable. And I mean, I work with meter plugs to make um, well, I have one meter, dynameter, aimed to help you measure the dynamics of your music. Um, and I often recommend, you know, I've just been talking about LUFS meters, and I recommend people use those or VU meters or whatever it might be. So I talk about a lot about this stuff. I don't actually use them myself when I'm deciding the sound for music, though. Um, you know, my process when I'm mastering, as I mentioned, because I've got my mon mastering monitoring level set so as soon as I hear the music, I know whether it needs to be louder or quieter. So I adjust that by ear. Then I tweak the EQ and all the rest of it. And when I've done all of that and I've got to the point, then I might look at the meters and go, oh, out of interest, what's the LUFS reading? How does the EQ response look? And the way that I use those meters is as a, a kind of a clue. You know, if, if dynameter is pushing right into the red or further into the, the brown, then that is a clue that maybe I've overcompressed it. So I should perhaps think again or if i see the true peaks are pushing really high maybe i'm limiting too much or if the lufs reading is super high maybe or a little bit low you know maybe i want to think about those things again but i use them very much as clues so it's kind of they, they make me ask questions but if i listened to the song and thought no actually musically that's absolutely right then the fact that it doesn't look great on dynameter or an lufs meter or whatever I'll just accept that, right? Because it's more important the way that it sounds than the way that it looks. Having said that, um, there, after all this time, there is a, I'm, I'm very tuned in to the combination of the two. So, I mean, for example, another plugin that I made uh, is called Loudness Penalty. There's a free website as well where people can go to find how the, their music is going to be changed in loudness when it's played back online. Um, I don't use either of those myself at all when I'm mastering, but I often will take something that I have mastered and plug it in just out of interest to see what happens. And I can pretty much guarantee that anything that I master won't have a loudness penalty of more than minus three dBs, for example, with the current settings. Um, might be minus two, might be minus one, might be zero, or might not have any change at all. Um, that's because the, what I'm doing with my ears and the other meters as part of the mastering process just gives me very predictable results. And, you know, I, I, I know what's going to happen at the final stage. So, but if you were learning, you could do it the other way around. You know, you could experiment and then kind of look at the results of these meters and go, oh, okay, that's being turned down more than I expected or that that's less than I expected or more than I expected and use that as a learning process to kind of go, okay, so it, since that's true, what happens if I change it and what happens if I do this? And then you can look at it on the meters and it can be really helpful to just figure out what's going on. <laughs> 
delivering uh, mastered material to the online platforms. It's not always easy. Some demands uh, minus 14 loves uh, and such. Can you explain a little about that problem? Yeah, so most, well, all of the mainstream music streaming services now use loudness normalization. Um, so that's not because they care about the loudness war. Um, it's because the main source of complaints from people to do with sound are to do with inconsistent loudness. So listeners don't like it if something is suddenly quiet or suddenly loud um, in comparison to what they've been listening to. Um, you know, they don't like being blasted by a sudden super loud song when they're listening in shuffle on a playlist, whatever. So the solution that the streaming services came up for that was to measure the loudness and all of them turn the loudest songs down. And this has happened in the been happening in the last five or so years, I would say. Um, I think I I wrote a blog post back in 2010 saying that Spotify would end the loudness war. Um, I was clearly hasty. I still believe that that's true, but it's not happening quickly. Um, and the reason I said that was that, you know, if you master something at minus four, um, but then it gets turned down to minus 14, what was the point of mastering it at minus four in the first place? Um, having said that, I don't recommend that people aim for minus 14 or any other number um, for all the reasons that we talked about before when we were talking about integrated loudness. Um, there's no need to master your music at minus 14 or any other loudness because the streaming services will adjust that loudness for us. Um, they might update those numbers in future. Spotify used to turn everything down to minus 11 LUFS. Now they turn it down to minus 14 LUFS. iTunes doesn't use LUFS right now, but the number that they end up with is roughly minus 16 LUFS. Broadcast requires everything to be an overall integrated loudness of minus 23 LUFS. Um, and I expect over time to see that that will become the number that is used for streaming as well. I'm talking about maybe five or 10 years time. Um, and people get very upset about this because they say, well, I, they're messing with the loudness of my music. But I mean, listeners have always messed with the loudness of music. The first thing that anybody does when they listen to a piece of music is adjust the volume to whatever they're doing. You know, if they're rocking out, they crank it up. And if they're working or have it as background music, they turn it right down. So we don't have any control over the, the final loudness. Um, all that's happening is it's becoming more consistent. Now, it's it's evolving very rapidly. Spotify changed the way that they implement this just at the beginning of this year. Um, they switched over to using LUFS and they stopped using a limiter to lift quiet tracks up on the default settings. So the situation is still evolving. The good news is, I mean, it used to be very, very confusing. The, diff the good news is that now it's kind of only somewhat confusing. Um, but the really good news is that I think it's it's gonna it's gonna continue evolving and becoming more standardized and more predictable so the most important thing i would say to people is that you need to you know master your music as it sounds best to you but then bear in mind that what's going to happen to it in some situations is that it's going to be turned down if it's loud to minus 14. Um, so to make that comparison yourself so OK, here's the mastered sound of my music. Now, how does it sound if I just turn it down? No other changes, just a straight change, volume change down to minus 14. And then I compare it with my favourite reference song at minus 14. Or, I mean, it, it could be minus 16 or 18 or 23. It doesn't really matter. Providing they're all the same integrated loudness, that's the important comparison to make. Um, and if your music still sounds good at a matched loudness, then it's fine. But if it sounds disappointing to you in some way, then maybe you want to think about why that might be and whether you want to make any adjustments to try and change it. So, you know, the classic example would be, you think it sounds amazing because it's super, super loud, 
but when you turn it down actually you start to notice oh actually i can hear the pump the compression pumping and it's kind of distorted and it sounds a bit lifeless and you know unimpressive in comparison to this other thing then you want to start asking yourself questions like with the meters it's like well why is that what can i do well if it's me i want to start doing experiments to to try and get it to sound better um so yeah it's not a question that and it's confusing because spotify for example say or what they actually say on their website is that if you don't want the loudness to be changed you should aim for minus 14. but i think that actually trips quite a lot of people up because even some of the most dynamic stuff if you take classic albums like i don't know back in black by acdc or uh, wish you were here by pink floyd or never mind the bollocks by the sex pistols those were loud records at the time when you measure them they kind of come in at minus 11 minus 12 lufs not minus 14. there is stuff out there that's at minus 14 i think Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits. The whole whole album is at minus, was mastered at minus sixteen LUFS originally, but those are quite rare, um, and part of that is that you know we talked about when you bring the level up, you have to start using dynamic control, and there is a benefit to that when we're talking about that sweet spot. If you go too far, it's a bad thing. If you don't go far enough, it's a bad thing. But if you're in the sweet spot, if you're in the zone actually that's when everything starts to come together and the music starts to sound really good and that's why you know that's the same kind of level that you would have used on vinyl or that you find when you measure vinyl that's why i think it makes sense to aim for or have that in mind as the goal um but that isn't minus 14 or any other number so you want to do what's right for the music and then check it at currently minus 14 and then whatever standards kind of emerge in future yeah but but um you you say don't aim for minus 14 but we have to aim for something um we all seek to to make it the best uh, make it sound good with what is already there um yeah yeah well and that's so the challenge is my advice is for me personally the loudest i master so that the loudest sections of my songs are at about minus 10 lufs short term um and i have the peaks at minus one so there's about nine dbs difference between the peak and the loudness at, at the louder sections of the songs and then everything else follows through um musically so if it was something like Back in Black by ACDC that was loud all the way through. The whole song would be about minus 10 and the integrated loudness would come out as about minus 10. So I think the loudest you want to go in terms of integrated loudness is around about minus 10. But it depends on the variety. If you, if I had a song that was much more varied, then the loudness might be minus 12 or minus 14. Um, so but that's the, 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 the I think the trick as far as I'm concerned is to always pay attention to the loudest moments and balancing everything everything else musically so don't aim for an overall target um, and then the numbers that fall out are what what happens you know it's just like as we talked originally when we talked about the difference between integrated and short term now that recommendation is quite conservative by modern standards you know if you look at Taylor Swift or um, I don't know drake or whoever it's quite likely beyonce um i mean if you look at skrillex it's going to be at minus four right um you know it, there's a lot of stuff that is mastered a lot louder so the other way of thinking about this is that if if you feel it's important to match the loudness of those then you're going to have to use those numbers as your targets um so you're, you're going to have to use those songs as your reference songs i would be cautious about that for for two reasons one is it you just make life hard for yourself because it's much more difficult to get great sounding results when it's super loud um i would argue that beyond a certain point you just can't there's always the negatives outweigh the positives um it's not to say that it would be a waste of effort but if you put all of that time and energy into making the stuff super loud and then it's going to get turned down anyway 
And at this point, people say to me, yeah, but what about on CD? What about on Bandcamp and uh, Beatport, I think, is not currently normalizing. SoundCloud doesn't normalize. And that is a challenge, right? On those platforms that have not yet added normal normalization, um, if something is way louder than yours, then yours might not sound impressive by comparison. My answer to that is it's going to come, you know, it's going to happen. It's it's moved across all the other majors, majors Spotify, Tidal, YouTube, Pandora. Um, actually, maybe Beatport do do it. I forget. Um, Amazon Music, they all normalize. Um, so something like and, and that's where most people hear music for the first time. So something like 90 percent of listeners are going to be hearing this stuff with the loudest stuff turned down. So. Yeah, and I see this kind of it's it's sort of cruel irony that the musicians and the artists who are the people who care most about the way that the music sounds, because they're worried about this 10% who are hearing it without normalization, are pushing the loudness up and potentially com compromising the quality. But nobody out there really listens to it that way. And and the thing is, people, music fans don't care. Sound on Sound magazine did some research where they showed that um, they literally just played exactly the same thing to people. And some of it was, I think, three or six dBs quieter. And it had no effect on whether people liked the music or not. Um, in the, There was no, you know, listeners just ignore it. They, they, they really don't care about that stuff. They listen to the music and whether it sounds good overall. Loudness is not something that they care about. So... <clears throat> Everybody has to make their own decision. You know, am I going to aim for those targets or am I going to do what's best for the music and what is best for the music anyway? You, you might, you know, decide that the loud sections of your music sound best at minus eight, whatever. Um, if that's the case, then that, that's fine. Um, but make sure you check it with matched loudness afterwards as well. Yeah. So the golden rule is, is um, do what you want <laughs> as long as you know the rules. As long as you know the rules, yeah, do what you want, yeah. but understand the effects of that. Understand the implications. Yeah. 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 One thing I've always wondered about um, when when you you mentioned it mentioned it uh, earlier uh, about headroom um, when you use minus one uh, and 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 minus fourteen loss, then it's only minus thirteen loss, isn't it? When, when that's the true peak is minus one, then you don't only have thirteen to work with. You only have a peak diff. Uh, you have a a peak to loudness ratio, or difference yeah. of thirteen. Yes, yeah. and actually, as I say, for the loud stuff, I'm more likely to be up at minus eleven or minus ten. So yeah. then you only got eight or nine. I th that for me, that's what I recommend on the mastering course that I teach because I know that people want to get their stuff as loud as possible. And that for me is, 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 so I have this idea of this thing called the, um, the loudness cliff. So, um, if you imagine, you know, music as, as they're, they're mountains and you're, you're pushing the boulder of your music up this mountain, trying to get it to the top, you know, um, and you want to be at the same height as all the other mountains. So you push it up and up and up and initially it's very, very hard. And then you get to the top and it starts to level off. And you're pushing and pushing and you can't get it any higher until it falls over the cliff on the other side and gets smashed <laughs> and i think it's the same with loudness you know you push it up and you up and you get to a point where it's just right and then you push it a bit further and it's too far and it gets ruined um so for me in terms of numbers that point where it's right in the sweet spot is where you've got this sort of eight or nine dbs difference between the peak and the loudness um but that's the loudest bit so then everything else kind of falls in with it um but yeah i, th I think um 12 certainly is is plenty you know when you look back at uh, all of those classic albums i mean for me when i listen to uh brothers in arms i think it, the original master i think it's probably a little bit too clean you know it maybe could do with a little bit of crunch a little bit of grit to it um so it could for, for, for my taste it could be pushed that a little bit harder and would still have sounded fine so yeah i'm i'm not purist about this at all i think it's it is it's it's what you think is right everybody has different opinions and different taste 
certainly more dynamic is not always better. For me, it's all about balance. It's about the perfect balance between loudness and dynamics. Yeah. Um, we talked a few times about um, your loudness penalty um, uh, website. Um, let's talk about that and your plugins. Um, what are you offering? Sure. Um, so the loudness penalty website is at loudnesspenalty.com. And it basically, you know, I was getting asked almost every day how, what will happen to my music when I upload it to YouTube or Spotify or Tidal or wherever. Um, and so the loudness penalty website is answers that question. You can just drag your file onto the browser. It doesn't get uploaded. It just gets measured in the browser on your computer. So it's completely secure. Um, and it, you know, it'll process and it will tell you, okay, this song will be turned down by three dBs or five dBs or seven dBs or not at all, or maybe even increased in loudness if it's a quiet song on Spotify. Um, we called it loudness penalty. Uh, it's a slightly controversial name deliberately. You know, there isn't really a penalty. It's like if your music sounds great when it's been turned down by seven dBs, then there wasn't a penalty. Um, for me, I kind of feel when something's been turned down that much, it's like, that's a lot of dBs of peak headroom that maybe I could make use of, you know? So I always want to make an experiment and say, okay, well, if I push it less hard so that it's not turned down as much, how does that sound? Um, the site has a preview function, so you can l listen to your... So, for example, you could have, let's say you wanted to make something you're using nine inch nails as a reference. You could have nine inch nails song on YouTube, open in one tab of your browser. You could open the loudness penalty tab in the other uh, site in another tab. You could preview your song from there at the YouTube level, which currently is minus 14 LUFS, and then flick across and compare it to nine inch nails and see how they sound next to each other. Um, we never meant for the site to be a plugin it was it was we put it up for free it was up for free for a year and we got so many requests for people saying can you make this as a plugin that we decided that we would um and it's turned out to be the most popular one we've done so far so the, the plugin version does exactly the same thing but you can run it in your daw um it has a couple of i mean the disadvantage is you have to with a website you can just drag a file on and it very quickly gives you the numbers with the plugin you have to play the song all the way through to get the final value but the the interesting thing about that is you can watch how the number changes over time. Um, so you can, you know, be playing through and you're thinking, oh yeah, this looks fine. And then suddenly it goes very negative and you realize that a particular section of a song is triggering a big loudness penalty. So if you are concerned about that, you can change it. Um, you can also kind of hover over some of the values and see. Um, so YouTube doesn't turn quiet songs up, for example. So if you're seeing a, a no change result, it means that your song is below their um, distribution loudness level. So you can hover over it and it will tell you, oh, you could turn this song up by 3 dBs without causing a penalty. Um, so lots of people find that kind of stuff useful. Um, that's the third thing. So I've done all this with a, in collaboration with a Canadian company called Metaplugs. There's a, the guy there is also called Ian, confusingly. He's Ian Kerr. Um, the first one we did was called Perception. Um, and we've just recently released the latest version of it, which is called Perception AB, um, because it's a automatically loudness matched sync compensating bypass switch for your any processing chain. So when you're mastering, you know, the, the classic thing when you're mastering is you have the unmastered song, you turn it up, you do your EQ, your compression, you think it sounds great, and then you compare it and you can't tell whether or not it really sounds good because the original one was so much quieter. So it's really important to match the loudness when you do that A-B comparison, that pre and post comparison, um, to make sure that you're really happy with the results of the processing that you've used. So Perception does that automatically. You, you let it measure the song for a bit, um, click the match level button, and then you can flick between the pre and the post signal of your processing chain, 
It even works for an external analog chain. So if you send it out through some analog gear and brought it back in, it works as well. Um, and you can do that comparison with the loudness matched. So you can really hear really accurately. And the, the new version also enables you to do that in the mix. So you can actually drag the pre onto all your channels in the mixer and then a post onto all your channels. You can match them all with one click. So in about four or five clicks, you can actually, if you wanted to, you could literally bypass your entire mix um, with the loudness matched. Um, not quite sure how actually useful that is, but whenever I tell people about, they go, "Oh, that's cool." <laughs> um, but the nice, the way that I prefer to use it is, for example, you might kind of think, "Okay, well, I've added a ton of compression and EQ to the bass, and I think it sounds better, but maybe it's just louder." So you put in a pre at the beginning of the processing chain, you put in a post at the end of the processing chain, match the loudness, and then click toggle between the two and you can hear it in context in the mix you think okay i'm happy with that but then you think okay but i also compressed the drum bus so then you could add another one to the pre and post of the drum bus and check that and you can check them individually or you can check them both of them simultaneously or you can get as many as you like so you you kind of get a sub mix within the the whole mix where you can do this level matched uh, bypass which is super useful so that was perception and then the other one is dynameter that i talked about so it, it shows you the difference between the peak and the loudness the short-term loudness as the song evolves um, and it color codes it so if something is being very heavily limited it will go it'll shrink down and go into the red you can see it getting squashed um, and then it goes beyond that to brown which is a color we chose to signify something that i have an opinion about in the music um, and then if there's more difference between the peak and the loudness, if it's more dynamic and it's less limited then you've got um orange yellow blue green so um, i designed that specifically so that the music that i master would look nice um, so if you're seeing pretty pictures on dynameter then uh, in my opinion the dynamics are in great shape um, but as i say it's a great way of a kind of early warning system you know you're working where you think it sounds amazing and you glance across and you can see oh it's it's getting really narrow and hitting the red a lot maybe i should think again about that or maybe not um yeah so you know the, the, i wanted to make perception because it was a plugin that i all of them are plugins that i wanted to use um okay. and i uh, teamed up with ian and we've made them and they, they've turned out to be really popular so you know and and i get loads of messages from people saying how helpful they've been how they've helped them get better results and that's you know that's really great to hear that's that's really uh that was the goal yeah Finally, um, you do have some some mastering classes. Um, can you tell a little about that? Yeah, so I've got the podcast. Um, I also do YouTube videos um, from time to time. Um, and there's a website called Production Advice. So I set up a website to help people with music production and I spend all my time talking about mastering. Um, but there you go, that's the name of the site. Um, but I also offer some um, video courses basically there's home mastering EQ um, home mastering compression and limiting um, which they're both a deep dive into you know EQ and compression in the ways that we've been talking about uh, today um, just kind of really digging into how I use them the kind of the practical aspects of what I've been talking about and then there's the home mastering masterclass which is actually an, an eight week course so every week in that i master a different song using a different piece of a different daw a different piece of software um and demonstrate different strategies so like it starts off quite simple and then it gets into stereo processing stem mastering um saturation mid side processing all of those kind of things and they come out one at a, one at a, per week um just to stop people kind of being overwhelmed um, but that also has the opportunity for people to email me and ask questions. Um, and uh, I have live Q&A sessions where I answer those questions and sometimes people join me on the call and we can kind of talk about any follow-ups they might have. And there's a Facebook group where people can interact and share songs. Um, there are interviews with the people who submitted the, the songs that I'm mastering and where we talk about some of the challenges they had when they were mixing them, what they hoped to get out of the mastering and... Um, 
how that works. Um, yeah, and you know, it's people people really like it. There's over a thousand people have taken the the Home Mastering Masterclass course now, um, and some of them some of them were professional mastering engineers to begin with. Some of them have gone on to become professional mastering engineers. Um, quite a few of them have done the course and said, thank you, it was fantastic. Now, please, can you master my album for me? Um, you know, it's, and, and actually lots of people have done the course and said that they found that it helps them with mixing um, because by understanding more about the mastering process, um, it enables them to kind of say to themselves, okay, that's fine, because that's going to be sorted out in the mastering and it's just kind of clarified for them what their goals are um, overall. So yeah, it's, um, you know, it's good fun. I really enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It, it was good to talk to you. Um, My pleasure. Hope, hope to talk to you again one day. Absolutely. Yeah. Be happy to.